Hi Founder fans, Jason here. And today we're going to be talking about a revolutionary who could not seem to make up his mind. He could not decide if he wanted to stay in the Continental Congress or go fight the war on the battlefield. So we spent the revolution going back and forth and doing both. Today's founder is a man named Oliver Wolcott. Now, Mr. Oliver Wolcott of Connecticut was the son of a colonial governor, which might imply that he was destined to do great things, but Wolcott was one of 13 children. And that doesn't mean he wasn't afforded great opportunities. He did receive enough of an education to go to Yale, where he actually graduated as valedictorian, and he studied both medicine and law. He was a very smart man. But he decided to use his brawn instead. And Oliver Wolcott went and served in the French and Indian War very successfully. And uh, during which and afterwards, he spent 20 years as sheriff of Litchfield, Connecticut. Now at the time, when you were a sheriff of a town in colonial and then early America, you were the only cop, <laughs> basically. Uh, so if there were some laws being broken, it was really up to you to stop it. You would go and do the arrests and such and so forth. If you needed a police force, generally it seems that you would go recruit from the militia. But in essence, he was the town's only police official for decades. Uh, and when the revolution broke out, everyone liked the cop. So they nominated him both to serve in the, uh, not only in the militia, but he was appointed a brigadier general in the Connecticut militia. And he was also appointed a delegate to the Continental Congress. And when he went to Philadelphia for the first time, he was named as commissioner of Indian affairs, which basically meant that he was in charge of trying to keep the Native Americans out of the war. We weren't going to get many of them on our side, we knew that, but we were just going to try and keep them at home. Which, you know, for the most part didn't work very well, but, you know, give it your best. Anyway, uh, Mr. Wolcott wa was, a, as I said, appointed a brigadier general in the Connecticut uh, militia, but he was very quickly uh, raised up to a major general in the Connecticut militia. And here's where I should remind you that during the war, it wasn't just one army versus the British. It wasn't just the Continental Army. There was the Continental Army, which recruited soldiers from all the different states, but each individual state had its own militia. So that means there were really 13 additional armies. And you know what? If you want to count uh, Vermont, that's 14, uh, with the Green Mountain Boys, uh, and, and Kentucky and Tennessee had very similar outfits. And even within the, the states, there were different levels of militia. So there were a whole lot of armies <laughs> fighting together uh, under the, which in hindsight we look back at as the Continental Army. So when Oliver Wolcott was appointed Major General, he was put in charge of all the Connecticut militia troops who were fighting in New York State. Now that's generally where, where um, at the time at least, where the main army under George Washington was. And to be fair, all the major generals, all the other officers of all these other armies would always default to, to, to Washington's wishes when fighting. You know, because everyone did want a united front. And even though they were technically separate entities who had separate leaders, those leaders, such as Oliver Wolcott, would have defaulted to Washington's demands because the only way you're going to win the war is if you win together and you follow one united front. So, uh, Wolcott goes in, uh, he, he does a little bit of fighting in New York, and then all of a sudden we hear about independence, and he's like, oh yeah, I'm a delegate to the Continental Congress. So he runs over, he missed the vote for independence, he runs over about two months late after everyone else has already signed the declaration, hops in, signs the declaration, and goes back to war. Uh, to be fair, he was not the first person to come late to this party, and he was not the last person to sign the document. Uh, people would kind of trickle in over the next year or so and continue signing the declaration, <clears throat> excuse me, when they had the opportunity. Because people wanted to get their name on that thing. <laughs> so Wolcott goes back to war. Uh, he plays a very important part in the Battle of Saratoga. Um, a, kind of a minor role because there were a lot of, we know now, more famous generals there, but he played a very important role. And then he goes back to the Continental Congress and he signs the Articles of Confederation. Oh yeah, we, we have a new government? Let me endorse that. And he does. Uh, and then he goes back to Connecticut. And then when the war ends, um, he, you know, he, he is no longer a delegate federally. Um, he instead, I'll say, retires to be lieutenant governor 
of Connecticut, which he does for about a decade. And then the last few years of his life, oh, and I, I almost left out, at the end of the war, he was still commissioner of Indian affairs this whole time, and he goes and writes the peace treaty, or is one of the authors of the peace treaty, with the Iroquois Nation in upstate New York, where I live now. And he, uh, which is, you know, one of the many treaties that we had to work out with the Native Americans, just like there were technically a lot of armies, in a fashion there were several wars with the British, and between the British and the French, and between the British and the Spanish, and between us and the Native Americans in the North, in the South, in the West, and he signs this one treaty. And I, like I said, he goes back to be lieutenant governor for about a decade, and then, the last few years of his life, he is rewarded with a position that makes a lot of sense, similar to the one his father had. He is governor of the state of Connecticut. And it's really interesting that he is so underappreciated when we talk about the American Revolution. I find a lot of Connecticut founders are fairly underappreciated. Because unlike Rhode Island, Connecticut was there the whole time. Rhode Island tried to hide and get out of the picture for a little bit. Uh, but, you know, Connecticut was there the whole time. And, and many Connecticut founders played an extraordinarily important role. So, uh, thanks, Connecticut. Anyway, that's the life of Oliver Wolcott. We'll keep it short and sweet. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you learning with me today. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please hit like. Let's see if we can get 12 likes today. That would be sweet. Um, and uh, if you have not subscribed, you just stumbled onto this video, please hit subscribe. I learn about the American Revolution and talk about it five days a week. Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to giving you another video tomorrow.